In 2014, the WHO reports a record 13 million people on ARVs. This number is set to increase with guidelines edging closer to universal test and treat, with more patients being able to choose ARVs. In South Africa, 5% of the population are currently on treatment, and with guideline changes, this percentage is set to increase. Of particular concern is that currently, in South Africa, 25% of those initiating are lost to follow-up at one year, and 25% on treatment are not virally suppressed, according to a recent NSP Progress report. Understanding the challenges to adherence to ARVs becomes then vitally important to the success of HIV programs. In this series, we will explore the various challenges and interventions which contribute to adherence. Dr. Catherine Orrell, a clinician and researcher at the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation, is an expert in adherence research and interventions. I am Dr. Catherine Orrell and I work for the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation at the University of Cape Town and I'm here today to talk to you about adherence and resistance to antiretroviral therapy. There are two essential components to adherence. When you start antiretroviral therapy, it is essential that you take your treatment every day. That means taking all your tablets at the correct time, which is actually asking your patient to be fairly robotic. It is quite a difficult thing to do. You not only have to adhere to those tablets that you take every day, you also have to um, stay in care. That means arriving for your visits, picking up your prescriptions, and not interrupting your treatment at all. A study in 2000 demonstrated that only adherence of 95 to 100% had long-term success of 80% or more. A concrete example of 95% adherence is missing less than 3 doses per month of current once-a-day regimens. If the adherence dropped off below 90%, the success rate for treatment over time drops off exponentially. The most important contributing cause to antiretroviral resistance is adherence. The contributing factors for adherence can be divided into medication factors, patient factors, and provider factors. So in medication factors, if you have regimens that are of sim similar efficacy and tolerability, a once daily regimen is recommended for a treatment naive patient beginning antiretroviral therapy. Um, at the moment, our first line regimen of choice is Tenofovo 3TC and Efavirenz, and we're in fact simplifying regimens of people who are not on that treatment regimen, such as on D4T, 3TC, and Nevirapine or Efavirenz on treatment from the last decade, and as long as they're virally suppressed and they don't have any uh, contraindications to the medication, we are moving them onto one tablet once a day to simplify their treatment regimens. Um, if you have an, a choice of regimens um, with separate tablets or combination tablets, fixed dose combinations are also recommend to decrease pill burden. So basically you want as few tablets as possible, um, as fewer number of times per day for dosing. Catherine has spoken about the benefits of the simplified first-line regimen of tenofovir, FTC and efavirenz, which in patients who can access this fixed dose combination means one tablet once a day. If the patient is non-adherent and develops resistance to the first line, they have to be switched to the second line which often consists of six tablets per day. Sister Pumi of MSF in Kailicha oversees the risk of treatment failure clinic at Ubuntu. It's very beneficial for the patients that are on first line, but the ones that are on second line, it's still a battle for them because we don't have a combination, we don't have fixed dose combination with second line. People that are failing second line, they are on alluvia. Some of them, you know, they are afraid to tell us as nurses that alluvia is giving them diarrhea. So alluvia is it's, it's quite a nice drug, but it is having side effects, you know. Some of the patients, we even have to change from alluvia when the diarrhea and the vomiting is bad. Then those patients are put on atazanave. The second line is a lot harder to take. Sometimes you have to take uh, three tablets in the morning, three tablets at night. There's a lot more side effects associated with that. I had a patient who was nauseous for a year. It's not a side effect that particularly worries a doctor, um, but it worried her and it made her not want to take her medication. Those are kind of things that need to be addressed as time goes on. The benefits of staying on first line are quite obvious, with second line having more drugs and increased side effects. It is therefore imperative that this is impressed upon the patient in counselling sessions. Proactive questioning and early treatment of side effects will enhance adherence as patients are not always forthcoming with this information. Patient risk factors for non-adherence include non-disclosure, mental illness and depression, alcoholism and substance abuse, pregnancy, children and adolescents, and food security. And these should be actively sought.
We need to encourage disclosure to, to antiretroviral therapy. Disclosure is a problem because, you know, when we, when we are talking to patients about the ones that are failing, it, then they are in a new relationship. If I disclose what's going to happen with me, with this relationship, because some of them have experienced rejection after disclosure. So they decide, look, I haven't told anybody that I'm HIV positive, so I'm not going to take my medication. My name is Mike Inilwe Kenny Ramabebe, and I work with MSF as a nurse mentor. Yeah, the uh, non-adherence challenges that we are encountering, or the patients are encountering, is the disclosure issue. Patients are not able to disclose their status to the family members because they are scared they are going to be stigmatized or marginalized. Another thing, the patients are um, afraid, or the, 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 the challenge that they are encountering, it's the lack of support from family members. Maybe because the family members or the community also are not capacitated enough, not given enough information. The, the, those who are mentally ill, including alcohol and depression, but also people um, with psychotic illnesses such as schizophrenia, do struggle to take their medication and quite often need a, a, somebody at home to remind them. We cannot pick up depression because the patient doesn't have any pains. So you only pick up depression when you are probing and we do have a tool where we are using semis, you know, where we can screen these patients and those are the only patients that are lucky. The ones that are working with counsellors that are trained in how to do semis so that they can pick it up. People who have issues with alcohol, drug use, um, also have issues with taking their tablets regularly. In, in, in Cape Town we have problems with people drinking at weekends and Fridays and Saturdays they're basically um, too drunk to remember to take their tablets and that means twice a week they're missing a dose of antiretroviral therapy that's crucial. So what we have done now with the new messages, you tell them that, look, you can still take your alcohol, but take your medication. So you work around times. What time are you going to enjoy yourself? Or what time are you going out? If they are saying it's 7 o'clock, and what time are you taking your medication? I'm taking my medication at 9 o'clock. Then you work around something, you know, that you can take a medication earlier before you go out with your friends or before you can take alcohol or you can take your medication where you are, at the tavern or at the shipping, you know. Pregnant women are a, a big group and they often initiate care somewhere else and then are transferred to, to uh, standard adult practice afterwards. Um, and we, a lot of pregnant women are lost to care in that transition process. The motivation for taking their treatment is often the fact that they want to protect their baby. And once the baby is born, that reason for taking treatment falls away and we lose a lot of people to care. So pregnant women are a special and important population to keep on care in care after the baby is born. So I'm Luzinda Kenneth. I'm currently the project doctor for the MSF Roma project. Uh, one of the greatest challenges for B plus is that uh, most of the mothers who actually come to deliver to these, uh, in these health centers come from other places. And when they come to these health centers because of the cultural aspect of having to deliver from their mother's side, they do not have proper access to these health centers. They don't have any records in these places. Starting ARVs on the same day would be a very good idea, especially in Lesotho, where transportation can be difficult, but also access to the health center. Because when you see a patient, you're never sure you're going to see them again because they have so many other challenges. Lesotho has one of the highest uh, mortality rates at uh, 11, 15 per 100,000 live births globally. Another thing that uh, our women face as a challenge is during pregnancy, usually uh, at seven months of pregnancy, they have to be moved back to their original home, from their husband's home. So if the plans are not made with the health center for how they will take their treatment, where they are going, they end up defaulting their treatment. So it is very important to inform the mothers that if they are planning to travel somewhere, they have to come to the health center before so that plans are made for how they will access their treatment wherever they are going. And then during, after delivery, if she is a PMTCT mom, 
she'll be told to come, you know, today for her art, and then next week maybe to come for the care of her exposed infant. So that lack of integration again is what the, the women uh, face as challenges. Children and adolescents can also be a challenge. Um, you can uh, address um, difficulty in, in, in taking medications by having pill swallowing training, adolescent friendly services, places where adolescents like to come to chill, to relax and meet others, rather than it being a burden and them standing out from the crowd by living with HIV. We should also, as providers, address food insecurity. People who don't have food to eat are more likely to be worried about that than taking their medication on time. A lot of people do not want to take a tablet on an empty stomach. Even though there's no contraindication to that, it's uncomfortable for them to do that. And food security is therefore quite important. The importance of adherence is unquestionable. The choice of medication, availability of FTCs, and antiretroviral tolerability affect adherence. Lastly, we have listed the various patient groups more at risk of being non-adherent. What is required is a probing and flexible approach which sees the patient or client as contributing in the solution of being more adherent.